Hello, hello. I'm Taryn S., uh, old school Southern Conjuring witch. I'm, I'm so lucky to be part of Moon Books uh, Authors, which is now Collective Inc. I have a book coming out, Conjuring Dirt, The Magic of Footprints, Crossroads, and Graveyards. And I'm so excited to be talking about one of my favorite parts of this book, Dead Things, Graveyards. And of course, I'm also going to tell you I have another book out as well, Hoodoo in the Psalms, where I've gone through all 150 of the Psalms and broke them down into their active verses, their incantation, that magic and shown a more modern day approach to working with this ancient grimoire. So if that is something that interests you, please check out my book, Hoodoo in the Psalms. And with that said, we're going to start this where we're talking about graveyard magic, and which I know for many of you folks reaching out, you're quite interested about this. This is a form of necromancy working with the dead. When we talk about graveyard magic, obviously we're talking about the fact that people are buried there. Their spirit, their essence is there, all right? And before I do that, I want to give just a little bit of technical history where we're going to talk about what's the difference between a cemetery and a graveyard. Graveyards are attached are typically associated with a church, with sacred ground, with a temple, something along those lines. That is the graveyard of the church. Cemeteries did not happen until the Victorian times, 1880s, 1890s. If you know anything about the Victorians is the fact they love fashion, they loved rules about fashion, all right, um, and the etiquette of it. And they really did influence our modern day views on how we personally deal with the dead. And they were the ones that came up with cemeteries. These beautiful park-like landscaped areas where you would come and commune with come and visit the dead. It didn't have the scary horror connotations we often think about like, ooh, it's a scary graveyard. That wasn't what was for them. For them, it was a place to go and commune. You also have to understand during this time was a spiritualist movement going on. All right, so talking with the dead, having relationships with the dead, was quite popular. They did it in parlors with seances. So at the same time they were doing this is when cemeteries were coming around. And that's where we have some of the most beautiful cemeteries. One of my personal favorite cemeteries is right down the road from me in Savannah, Georgia, and it's Bon Adventure Cemetery. And it was created by this world-renowned landscape guy in the turn of the century, 1900s turn of the century, and just created this beautiful place. There was already an existing graveyard that became a larger graveyard that became a cemetery, which is part of its history. We talked about the fact graveyards and cemeteries. Now we're going to get into the interesting part on graveyard magic. As I said, it is a form of necromancy meaning we are working with the spirits of the dead. We are doing so consensually. We are doing so in a way that the spirits want to be around us. This is not commanding and compelling. This is about having relationships with our ancestors, having relationships with our spirit guides, having relationships with protector entities, deities, energies, whatever your phraseology, but bringing a benefit to our life. All right, having grandma's graveyard dirt. Why would I have grandma's graveyard dirt around me? 
because it's my way of staying connected to my ancestors. It also allows grandma an easier conduit to speak to me. A lot of times we leave out cups of water during the season of the dead because they are conduits for the dead so that it's easier for them to speak to us. When we use graveyard dirt, this is a conduit that we are opening up so that our ancestors can speak to us, can give us guidance, can give us comfort. And all. sometimes you just want that feeling of a hug is what you're looking for with this. And also this is about having spirit guides, ancestors as protectors around you. When you get that little feel it on the back of your neck that something's coming. That's spirit giving you that little feeling. How does spirit able to do that? It's because you've set up an environment that it's easy for them to come into. So you would use some of your ancestral dirt. And I know some folks do not have access to family dirt per se. So they're left wondering, well, what, you know, graveyard spirits can I work with? You can still work locally, the graveyard that's closest to your house. You can get to know these are the ancestors of your uh, area, the genie loci. They're a type of. Always remember, your town has protectors. They're the, the people that lived there before you. They're the people that founded the town. All right? So you have layers of spirit folks. So even if you don't have access to your grandma, grandpa's dirt, you have access to spirit folk that are protectors. All right. There are so many different types. That's what just makes it amazingly wonderful. And where I'm going to give the shout out on, I wrote it down in the book, guys, Conjuring Dirt all these different types of spirit folks that we can learn to work with are we often think that we just work with our our ancestral bloodlines but we also work with our spirit guides we work with the genie loci we work with the spirits of the graveyard down the street from us and we do that by research learning who those people are down the street from us how they're lives were who they what what they were about you know i have my backyard uh actually backs up to an ame graveyard a historically black church graveyard here in the low country of charleston and i immediately googled the name of the church and started going down the rabbit hole of learning about that so that way i can give honor at some point um i just recently moved back from california i was here in the low country and i moved to california for seven years and i'm back now and so i'm getting to know my dirty again i'm getting to know the dead folk again i'm getting to know where the grave sites the graveyards the cemeteries with their spirit folk that want to work with me. As I said earlier, we are about making friends with, all right? There's a beautiful, another graveyard down the, the street from me here that I, I did stop at and read the name of it and, you know, did a little walk around looking into it to see who was there. And then I came home and I Googled it so I could learn more about it and understand what was going on, who were there, what the relationship was to the land around here. And if this is something that potentially this is a, a graveyard I can work in, or if this is a graveyard that I can't work in. All right, just because you can walk into it don't mean you should be there. Then we all have to be mindful of that when we're working graveyard magic. If you are not working outside of ancestral folk where you're off trying to make friends with other spirit people, honor, reverence, and respect. 
All right. Um, and I, I say this over and over, and I, it, it is a guiding factor when it comes to graveyard magic. Graveyard magic is, is, is very easy on one hand, and on the other hand, it takes some while to learn. Just entering the graveyard is something that for many folks, there is a ritual to that. That is where they're dealing with the gatekeeper spirit, the spirit of the, the protector of that graveyard. For some, it's a dark man. For some, it's a Papa Legba. For some, it's just an old guy at the gate. It depends on your region. We'll learn folk magic as to who this gatekeeper is. Um, I love the fact that a lot of times it is just referred to as the gatekeeper with no description because I believe that each of us sees the gatekeeper that we need to see. All right. The gatekeeper that I see is different than the gatekeeper that you see. And I also believe that every graveyard, every cemetery has a different gatekeeper. And when you get to the gate, giving some sort of acknowledgement. If it's a simple nod, sometimes it's an elaborate turn three times, say a prayer, uh, put a cigar, put X amount of coins in a certain combination. For some, it's one of each denomination, meaning I would put a penny, a nickel, a dime, a quarter. For others, it's three nickels and five dimes and seven quarters. Whatever your intuition is calling for you to do is what you need to do. For sometimes it's as simple as pouring a little libation. You'll get a little rum, say here to the gatekeeper. You pour it on the ground. Sometimes there's a leaving a food offering. Sometimes you leave seashells. Y'all see where I'm going, don't you now? It's really you have to work on intuition. And that's what makes graveyard magic so hard is because you got to do you, boo. There's nothing in a book that tells you how to approach your grandma's graveyard, your grandma's grave. Only you know that. That's your family. When you're dealing with your spirit guides, there ain't no book that's going to tell you the offerings to your personal guide. Only you know that. And so it's so important that you take the time to really be in the headspace, to really tune in. I have a little basket that I start putting things in, and I will actually just walk around the house, walk around space, and pick up things that sort of seem to need to go in there. And I don't overthink it. When I get to the site, I will pull out what I feel is necessary, what I feel I'm compelled to pull out. It changes every time. All right. Again, there is no, you must do this at the gate every time you go because every gatekeeper is different. Every cemetery graveyard is different. Every situation is different. So tune in and believe in yourself. All right. We are witches, magical practitioners, conjuring folk. All right. We all know where the magic is. It's in us. And when we work with graveyard magic, it is so important to, it's in us. Do what feels right. Do what you are compelled to do. All right. Honor, reverence, and respect. I always go back to those words, you know. But it's about you really tuning in and feeling it. Feeling that breeze. You're going to know the difference between, ooh, that's a breeze that went down the spine of my neck and that ain't good versus, ooh, this is a nice welcoming breeze. All right. Only you know that in the moment you're standing there. And that's what Graveyard Match is about. And if you get that chili down the spine and you're like, oh, this don't feel right. 
That means that those spirits that night in that graveyard are not welcome to working with you. That's all. And it's about politely picking up your things and leaving. Um, you may be able to come back another night to that graveyard, or that graveyard may not be a good graveyard for you to work in. It just depends. How do you know? Go back again. Get the same feeling. Odds are these are not spirit folk that are open to working with you. Leave. Find a graveyard that is. There are many out there that are more than open to working with you. And which when you walk into that space, you get that tingle in your toes and you feel good to be there. And you feel like you're getting spiritual hugs. That's the graveyards we're looking for. Where these are folks, spirits, entities that are okay with working with you. If you, again, are working outside of ancestral lines, you're working with a grave, a person, a spirit that you have identified, found, or somehow this is where you are, and you're developing a relationship with them. You will learn as you go what that particular spirit wants as far as offerings. When we're doing workings, if I'm looking for protection per se, you'd say, oh, go to a, you know, policeman's uh, great. Maybe not all policemen protect you. I don't know if I actually want a policeman. You know, just because they have an attribute does not mean it's the best attribute. They'll talk about, ooh, I got judges dirt. And my response always back is, was he a good judge? Was he fair? Or was he corrupt? Because depending on the work that I'm doing, I may want a fair judge. Y'all see what I'm saying? But also depending on the work that I'm doing, I may want me a corrupt judge. Mm -hmm. And what if I think that I'm doing a fair working and I have a corrupt judge, or if I have a corrupt judge and I'm doing a fair working? So don't just because it says it's a judge's grave that, oh, I got judge's grave. I got judge's dirt. I can do this and that. No, you can't. That dirt, that spirit, that whole side, carries the essence, the character of that person. If they were a corrupt, terrible person, you're getting that essence, you know? It's like, you know, gambling. They talk about gambler stir. The question is, was he good at winning or was he good at losing? Was this a gambler who never won? You know, that's like Las Vegas stir. You just never know which way it's going to go on there. And you have to be very mindful of that. When we get into the graveyard, this is slowing it down, taking your time. They always do the movies at midnight, rush into a graveyard. That's not how it goes. Most time it's in the afternoon where we can have a picnic, a lunch, take our time, you know. Like I said earlier, I have a basket. I also have a picnic blanket. I'll spread it out and do a, a, a lunch with the dead. All right? And it's been time in that space and seeing which spirit, which entity is calling to me. Walk around. Take your time, you know. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to be visiting graveyards so nobody, you know, don't show up with a dressed as a witch holding a broom uh, type thing. Show up respectful, blending in. You got a basket. I, I, I have a joke with folks that I'm going to show y'all something. When I talk about getting graveyard dirt, y'all see what I got. You see the size of this cute little spoon? That's the size. That's, that's all you need. This isn't showing up with a, a bucket and a, a, a shovel and things like that. The other thing, 
cute little glass tube. Cute little shovel. This is what we're talking about, all right? Please do not desecrate. Do not destroy. Do not harm. Do not alter a grave site, a cemetery, a graveyard. Very, I can't even say enough how important that is. All right? Never dig near the actual tombstone. You could destabilize it. Be mindful. When we are there, it's about leaving no trace. And if possible, leaving it better than we found it. All right. If you have the opportunity to, to clean up a little bit, and if you're in a lot of the, the cemeteries, uh, graveyards have a perpetual care uh, landscape guy. All you have to do is make a, a little pile at the end of the plot and then they'll drive by and pick it up. And they really appreciate when you do those things for them. But this is very mindful. We do not show up with buckets and shovels and dig up people. Our fur babies or any other thing. Um, and that's something else is that working, if you have in a, a fur baby, you have a great site. That is the dirt of protection. That's the dirt of a loyal friend. That's the dirt of someone looking out for you. So don't be afraid to bring that home. You know, when we talk about bringing it home, I want to show you all. This is my little dish that I like to use, especially if I'm doing uh, dirt workings. I love this for putting the dirt in with. A lot of times when I do, I like to blend calendula flowers. The reason I like to blend calendula is because they've been associated with the dead for thousands upon thousands of years. And the other thing they do is they promote communication with the dead. So I will take my little bit of graveyard turks. My little bit of calendula flowers. And you can have your own combination if you especially if you have herbs or or scent. That you know that that particular dead person has an affinity for, like if you know that they really like lavender, then you would probably want to put lavender. Or if you knew it was somebody that had loved roses or camellias, or even a certain uh, perfume signature, you know, you this is the olfactory is what we're going after, and so use that. You know, my mom loves Chanel Number no. Five. For you old school folk out there, I know there's a couple old ones out there. Like I know what that is. Um, so uh, to put a little Chanel Number no. Five on mom's dirt would make complete sense. All right, because that is something that would attract her, something she would know, and it would be a great offering. And so here is my little dish, and I'll take the dish. And I'll put it up on my altar or on a space that I've created so that I can have it close by. And I will sprinkle herbs on it. Like I said, I might spray perfume. I may put other things on it. Um, this is if they're, you know, a coffee drinker, maybe a little bit of coffee. If they smoke cigarettes, cigars, maybe tobacco. Y'all get what I'm saying. Back to knowing the spirit. And if you, as I said earlier, if you start out with an unfamiliar spirit that you're slowly getting to know, in time, it will tell you. They will tell you what they have an affinity for. All of a sudden, you'll have this like really deep, like almost you'll be compelled. You'll be like, they want coffee. Hey. They want a diet sprite or, or something really off end. 
And this is where you have to believe in yourself, trust your personal intuition, your connection to the spirit, and do whatever your feeling needs to be done, you know? And of course, when you have the, you know, something like this set up, um, this is where you may play music that they like, you know, that they grew up with. Um, uh, what is it? Books that, that, you know, they like things that, you know, poetry. Um, and it, 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 I always tell folks, it doesn't matter what your religious uh, affinity is. What matters is the spirit's affinity. If the spirit's Catholic, speak Catholicism. Spirit Baptist, speak Baptist. Spirit's pagan, goddess worshiping, speaks pagan goddess worshiping. All right. Uh, it's a way of showing respect to spirit that, you know, this is what their belief is. Um, um, you can still bring some of your self into that, but we always have to be mindful and respectful of the spirit. One of the things for me, when I have my grandma stir around and I've got an active ancestral altar, I request that people do not use profanity in the space because my grandma was a that. Woman went to her grave on thou shall not say cuss words. And I know that. And a way of showing respect, a way of showing honor and reverence to her is when she is in space, we don't cuss there. You can go outside and stand on the porch and say all you want to say, all right? But when you're in my grandma's space, I request that you please show a little respect to her in that realm. And again, this may be something when you're dealing with different ancestors and spirits where you know that certain things are or are not accepted and that you need to do that. And do not feel uncomfortable telling folks, no, my dead grandma said you can't do that. That's when we work. When I have my spirits around me, I honor them. And in return, spoke earlier, wisdom, protection, guidance. It is mutual, but you have to work at it. Another thing I've, I've had folks asking, talking to me about, is that they, they, they just don't feel like grandma's listening. They went to dad's gray pops are great cry and then i feel like that. i was like well where's your life at right now what are you doing have you not paid any attention to them all these years and now that your life is a shit you come running to them and ask them for help i was like do you not listen to yourself did not grandma always tell you you got to clean up your room before you get a snack now you're showing up with a dirty room and asking for things. Sometimes our ancestors, our spirits, they're not there for us because they know that in this moment and this time, you got shit to work on. You need to be walking the walk. All right. It's one thing to sit and talk the talk, but are you walking the walk? Are you living a life of honor? Are you living a life that your grandmother would, I'm not going to say approve of, but would understand, all right? Y'all get what I'm saying, okay? Don't you pay no attention to these spirits, and then you show up all of a sudden asking for help and wonder why they ain't helping. Hmm, I wonder why not, too, you know? I ain't seen anybody for how long, and all of a sudden I knock and tell you I need this, this, and this. And you're like, well, that's not a good person. They didn't show up when they didn't need anything. Now they only show up when they need stuff, you know? So think about that, all right? And how important it is to have an ancestral altar, to developing a relationship with the spirit. Uh, typically during the season of the dead. Different traditions, different magic folk, different times. Most of the time it's somewhere in October, somewhere it's from fall equinox, September 21st, until December 21st, 
is actually this dark time of the year. This is a season of the dead. Many practitioners, different times, some it's only on Samhain, Halloween night, some it's the night before, two nights after, getting into all uh, Saints Day. For others, it's the entire time period. I know me personally, I typically start feeling the dead sometime around the end of September, 1st of October, and I will set up my ancestral spaces, and I will have the graveyard dirt that I have of different folks set up on there as a way, again, that conduit, that connection, that way to work with them. I personally keep my altar up most of the time until about the end of November, and then I can start like feeling the shift towards winter solstice. I think this is for each practitioner. It is different. Again, the separate, your relationships, all right? If you feel you need to keep one up year round, which many practitioners do, then that is something you need to do. And setting a space up where you can honor and develop a relationship with the dead using graveyard dirt. Now, I know a lot of you were leaning in going, well, she talked all about this good stuff, but she didn't talk about the after midnight workings where we use graveyard dirt for cursings. All right. I always want to start with, yes, we do, but we are so slow to do these things. This is Hollywood's done taking us over, folks. Within folk magic, within Southern Conjure, within hoodoo, for us, it's about working justified. Justified vengeance are working what we often refer to as righteous. Are you righteous in your working? If you are, then whatever you got to do. Can you use graveyard dirt for that? Absolutely. Typically, we pick a grave that meets the attributes, the characteristics, and the energy. All right. If I'm looking for, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get too specific about this, witches and other interesting magical beings, um, because I always want to encourage folks um, to last resort to use these methods very sparingly um, as a Kajur who's been in community 40 plus years. These are not things that are our go-to. All right, I do not curse on folk. Um, if I'm putting someone up in a sour jar, they have done something morally or ethically wrong. And, and again, that it's justified. Again, it's righteous where I'm like, mm-hmm. How would I do that? I would potentially, I'm just saying hypothetically, I'd go out to the west side of a graveyard knowing that if I find an impression in the ground outside the wall, that that is a person that the church deemed undesirable, typically somebody involved in SA, somebody involved in murder, or somebody involved in some really shitty stuff. And I'll be looking for that dirt to put in a sour jar with the name of the person that I ain't wishing well, and that that becomes their nightmares. And so I would send the spirit to the person. Just saying hypothetically, I ain't saying nothing because I ain't saying nothing. All right. I'm a happy dark witch. Like I said earlier, I'm about, um, we seek every option before we ever consider these type of things. But absolutely, there are some folks, honey, you just got to hit them as hard as you can. And when it comes to conjure, as far as our three times three, where they're like, oh, if, you know, it comes back at you three times, if you do something on it. And we're like, no, honey, if you come at me, I'm going to come at you three times as hard so that you never mess with me again. Uh, but that is only in the rarest of circumstances. Um, do not show up 
in the middle of a graveyard after midnight with a shovel randomly taking someone's dirt. Not only can you get in trouble in the physical realm, like it's illegal, you can be charged with trespassing and get a criminal record, but you are disrespecting spirit on a level that is not going to serve you well. All right? Nothing good is going to come of it. This isn't frivolous, ooh, giggly, funny things. This is a serious time and effort is spent on working with this, even though I'm working with my ancestors, making sure that I go out to the cemetery on potentially a day that is of significance, an anniversary, a birthday, a day of memory, whatever is, again, that particular person. You know, I often tell the story of my grandmother um, at the Sunday after Easter, they would change out the flowers from Easter Sunday. And my grandma and a couple of the other ladies would be out there and they would have big handfuls of flowers. And grandma would take it out and lay these flowers on her family members' uh, grave sites. That becomes a significant day for me personally now to go to my grandmother's grave on the Sunday after Easter and to lay flowers on her grave. All right. Um, and, and, you know, for other folks, it would make no difference because they're like, why is she doing it this Sunday? But for my grandmother, that's a very significant date. And so when we talk about our ancestors, what was the significant date of your ancestors? What are some of the stories you know? And honoring that, if there was a certain holiday that was their favorite holiday, you know, um, making sure that you give a little honor on that day, a little remember. I, I think the biggest thing um, is remembering is, you know, it, it, those in which are remembered live through us. So it's about speaking their names and speaking those names out loud, telling those stories. Like I just told the story about my grandma. That's a way of keeping my grandma connection is when I get to tell these stories to you folks, to people out there. All right. And those are the stories that you need to have and learn um, so that you can tell. And we all have some of the most amazing, interesting ancestors and families. A lot of times people are like, oh, we're not mine. And then they get into it. They're like, oh my God, I never knew this. So take the time to really learn your family's history. And we typically only remember three generations back and then the fourth generation loses the story. See if you can grab that fourth generation story. And then learning the history of the town you live in. All right. And how it came about, who the founders were and, and who, where they're buried at. If there's anyone of significance, any notable people in your area that are buried, where are they buried at? And going and giving honor to them, going and spending time with the dead. You know, don't just run into a graveyard, grab something and run out and think it's, you've done something that's going to work. Honey, all you've done is taken a handful of dirt. You just got your hand dirty. That's it. You ain't got no spirit. You ain't got no communication. If anything, you may have a spirit that's upset with you for just respecting their graveyard. All right? You want to go spend time in that graveyard. You want to go learn the history. Who all's buried there? Go have a picnic there before you ever contemplate taking dirt from it. That's, yeah. That's what I'm saying right there. You know, and I will say if any of you do have a question, now's the time to type it in because we're getting into uh, our last five, 10 minutes of a chat. And 
I always love it when people do ask me questions. So uh, let me look up. Now is the time to do it. I have so, so enjoyed getting to talk about this. I feel like I could just keep talking for hours because there's so many different aspects of working with graveyard uh, dirt, graveyard magic. Uh, the biggest thing I have to say, honor, reverence, and respect, this isn't play dirt. This is someone's life. This is someone's essence. And to always be mindful and to remember that when you're working with this magic. And this is a magic that is so beneficial, all right? Um uh, with in the end, when we start sitting up our altars and everything, it's these beautiful, warm, spiritual hugs that we're surrounding ourselves with. When people ask me why I do it, I'm thinking, because I like the feeling of my spiritual grandma hugs. I like the feeling of my spirit folk around me that have got my back. That's what I like. And I'll... And so I hope all of you enjoyed this. If you're interested in getting to know more about what I do, please go to houseofwitchcraft.com. Um, I also have a House of Witchcraft on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Um, I post content up there. I would love to see you come at everything. And I see that everybody... Uh, Give me one second to put my glasses on, girlfriend. I, that's our yes. Um, when we talk about ancestors, we need to be mindful a lot of times. A lot of times they're not actual genetic blood ancestors. There are chosen ancestors, our chosen family uh, type ancestors. So yes, uh, I, you know, if you are adopted into a family, um, the the ancestors get you too. It just doesn't mean the living people get you. The ancestors are excited. The ancestors are happy for it. Uh, I've heard some beautiful stories over the years about this, where um, you, you, it, it is your family. And a lot of us are raised in chosen families. Um, they're not our blood genetic family. They are chosen family. Those people are there for you in spirit realm, all right? It doesn't end. All right? Just because you die, that don't mean anything, all right? It, they're still there for you. And a lot of our spirit guides are not blood to us. They are there by our attributes. It is very common if you get in magic community, a lot of us uh, have uh, affinities, relationships with uh, magical practitioners that are that have died. Well, you know, a lot of us put Marie Laveau on the altar. Uh, you know, I put Caroline Die on my altar, um, which was a very famous magical Southern magical practitioner in the 1800s, um, and Count her as one of my spirit guides. And so, yes. You can have relationships that have nothing to do with blood, all right? It's just your own personal circumstances. Thank you so much for asking me that question. That's such a good question to ask because I know that a lot of, I think very few of us actually have what we, this traditional family mode. Um, there are those that do, but it's not the everybody gets it. I think like, Maybe half of us do. The other half of us have these creative families. And our creative families stay with us on the spiritual side as well. With that said, which is in other interesting magical people, I so enjoyed this opportunity getting to sit here and talk with you. My book, Conjuring Dirt, is a, oh, you can see I'm sitting here with my bookmark, is available for pre order. Um, it will be released on October 1st. On October 14th, you can go onto my 
YouTube channel, House of Witchcraft, where we will be doing a live book release party at Papa Nico, uh, Nico World in Florence, South Carolina. Um, we're going to be doing a book release party there. We're going to be doing it live. And so I really hope to see all of you there. Again, thank you all so much for your time. And as always, get out there, fly your brooms, have a bright, blessed day. Amen. Bless be our shade and a bubble.